to their 15 minute time limit. And so, uh, let me see where, are there a copy of the program? Oops. Um, our three panels today are Edgar Melker, um, Didi Yuxel, and forgive me, um, the third panelist is Joshua Roos. And they will be speaking today on, um, I'm sorry, I've, I've missed it. Oh, wait a minute. Is this the one? There we are. No? Wow. <laughs> I did not bring the paper with the title of the panel. Uh, but our speakers today, and I have their bio data, however, I do not have their paper titles. Does anyone? I'll bring it to you. Okay, thank you, Ayla. I'm sorry, it's it feels like a very disorganized morning, but I've decided to be submitted to God because if God had wanted us to be here a half an hour ago, we would have been here a half an hour ago. There we are. There we are. My apologies. My apologies. Oh, it's in the booklet. Okay, our first panel today, Religious Law Under Secular Constitutions. Our discussants, uh, Edgar Melker, will be talking to us about academics, imams, Believers and the State, Religious Authority in Modern Islam, and the American Judicial System. And Indy Gibson and Blaise Shaban will be speaking to us about the Peacemakers Constitution. And Joshua Bruce will be talking to us about Sharia, Islamophobia, and legal pluralism in practice. Insights from Sydney and New York. I'm very excited to hear these presentations. And I look forward to uh, each of you. And we'll start. Uh, with Edgar Melger, who is at Princeton University. He's a uh, doctoral candidate in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. Uh, welcome, Edgar. Good morning. Uh, and the title of my presentation is, uh, it's mainly focused on expert witnesses in the American judicial system. In recent years, with the growing population of Muslims in the United States, there has been a considerable increase in the number of cases in which the American judiciary has addressed questions that, in one way or another, involve Islamic law. Generally, the cases heard by American courts that address Islamic practices can be classified into two categories. Cases involving the state's duty to protect an individual's right to free exercise under the First Amendment and associated statutes, and cases involving the state's power to vacate private or family disputes settled according to religious law or religiously sanctioned procedures. When deliberating on cases in either of the two categories, the courts must focus on different aspects of the Islamic tradition. In those cases involving religious free exercise, courts interpret Islam primarily as a set of divinely mandated practices. Alternatively, in those cases involving family law or arbitration of disputes, Islam is regarded as a legal system that can run parallel or can be integrated into the secular common law. In addressing questions of Islamic practice, in particular with matters regarding the validation of cases in family or contract law, American courts have tended to reveal a perception that, even while certain provisions of Islamic tradition may be compatible with the secularized American law, Islam remains fundamentally an unknown, foreign, somewhat distant system of law. Certain levels of prejudice could certainly be considered as underlying factors informing the position of some judges, but other more substantive factors must also be recognized. In cases of family law, something as simple but fundamental as language often creates a sense of estrangement between judges and their Islamic subject matter. When we consider examples, for instance, of cases where judges have had to rule on a matter contract written in Persian without being provided an English translation. Uh, concerns have also been voiced regarding a perceived incoherence associated with the Islamic tradition, particularly due to the absence of a definition of Islamic law, fragmentation between different Islamic schools, and the absence of a single codified and universally applicable form of Sharia. Courts have also addressed a sense of fragmentation with the ways in which Islamic traditions are put into practice by believers. Confronted with a heterogeneous and seemingly foreign or unknown system of law, courts have turned to expert witnesses to guide their interpretations of Islamic religious practices. Now, expert witnesses are a common feature of American courts. The federal rules of evidence allow for testimony by an expert witness when he or she, quote, is qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education, end quote. The statute provides additional guidelines as to the admissibility of testimony provided by expert witnesses, quote, it does not require that published studies or similar authority unequivocally support the expert's conclusions, 
An expert need not have formal training in his or her area of expertise. And lack of textual authority in support of an expert's opinion goes to the weight, not to the invisibility of the testimony." End quote. Thus, the expert witness need not be an ultimate authority on a given subject, but can, at the very least, provide a court with relevant information that it might otherwise lack. In cases regarding Islam, American courts have relied on the testimony of two types of witnesses, imams, and more often, Western academics of Islam. The object of this presentation is to offer a broad survey of the ways in which expert witnesses have participated in cases involving Islamic law and the American legal system. To do so, I refer to a series of exemplary cases that illustrate the engagement of scholars in legal disputes that can only be resolved by interrogating a given principle in the Islamic tradition. Notably, in this regard, devoid of ethnographic input, my study as my presentation will rely on an extensively textualist interpretation of the question that seeks to reconstruct the problem purely through the lens of case law, and cases that I approach primarily as a social historian rather than as a legal scholar or a scholar of Islam. My goals are twofold. First, to offer an introductory, if somewhat generalizing, survey of the ways in which expert witnesses, whether in the form of moms or academics, take an active and often positive role in facilitating the settlement of disputes around Islamic law. And second, to identify a trend whereby academics are generally deemed as more reliable experts on Islam than imams, and at times even believers. Uh, my emphasis is that expert witnesses can play a very positive and needed role in the courts, but that we have to recognize critically that there is a certain relationship between knowledge and power underlying the type of, pres the type of input that these expert witnesses can provide. In cases regarding the government's responsibility to protect the free exercise of Islamic beliefs, courts often turn to imams to provide expert testimony as to the centrality of a particular practice in the religious universe of Muslims. When prisons are being sued by incarcerated Muslims for failing to provide accommodations for the free exercise of their beliefs, warden-appointed Islamic chaplains are often called by the defendants, in this case the prisons, to provide support for their claims. In Lewis v. Scott, for instance, when two, a, court, a case from 1995, when two inmates sued the Texas prison system for not allowing them to grow beards, the defendants called the prison again, called on the prison chaplain to protest their claim that growing beards was not imperative for pious Muslims. And the court record reads, quote, Chaplain Shabazz, an Islamic chaplain in the Texas prison system, emphasized that wearing a beard is not a religious obligation as it is not dictated by the Quran, but he acknowledged that beard wearing was dictated by the Sunnah. He had talked to many imams who agreed with him, but noted a more ex that a more extreme imam might disagree." End quote. When courts attempt to apply certain principles of Islamic law, either in personal or contractual law, imams can offer a more detailed explanation of the meaning of specific concepts in the tradition. For example, in one case regarding the applicability of a modern contract, a man asks his imam to provide the court with a more detailed explanation of Islamic marriage contracts. Uh, similarly, in one divorce proceeding, a wife asks her imam to provide testimony on the meaning of the sadaq. In these cases, imams function essentially as translators, making use of their knowledge in order to elucidate otherwise unknown or ambiguous court, or excuse me, concepts to the court. In some cases, however, different imams can provide contradictory testimonies, reflecting again the fragmentary nature of religious authority within Islam. In a controversial case regarding the rights of a Muslim army official to refuse to fight against fellow members of the Ummah, the defendant tried to support his claims by printing, and the defendant in this case, a soldier who wish not to fight, uh, try to support his claims by printing answers provided by scholars associated with the European Council for Fun. Especially in this room where I teach quite frequently. Uh, time is the enemy of all of us at this particular <laughs> moment, so I really urge you, and I hope the organizers make that available to you, if not right to these authors. These are three extremely rich papers, lots of wonderful detail that you're really going to love. I particularly want to urge you with a paper like Edgar Melgar's, which is an excellent gathering together, quite aside from the analysis, of lots of these American cases involving Muslims. For those of you who are not lawyers, don't be afraid of legal cases. They're just stories. You don't have to have a law degree to use them with your students, to read them, to understand them. He's going to tell you a good deal about them. He doesn't always tell you who won, so that's an enticement to go and read these cases. The paper is about much more than just the use of experts, but since he focused on that, I'm going to focus on it a bit, too. Disraeli did not say that there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. He said there are lies, damn lies, and experts. And Carl Sandburg said that an expert is just a damn fool a long ways from home. 
whether you want to rely, the, the, the fundamental question is, if you're going to bring Islam into, say, an American court of law, who speaks for Islam? And is there only one? And is it always the same? If you bring in the quote-unquote experts, wherein lies not only their expertise, but, you know, uh, you know, as I say, you know, two experts, three opinions, you'll, you'll get all sorts of different opinions uh, on these sorts of matters. The American courts, I'm going to defend them a little bit. American courts have tried to deal with religions that are not quite mainstream. Think of Jehovah's Witnesses, think of the Amish, think of a number of these other groups. An awful lot of American law has been made from the quote-unquote marginal religious group, First Amendment sort of law, and it's going to happen with Muslims as well. I think the American courts have generally tried to understand what is going on in other religions, but they do it against the background of what they think they know. And so the criteria that are often applied are ones, because it's the style of American common law reasoning anyway, done by analogy. What is this like in the thing that I've got my foot planted on is what I'm familiar with, and now in this crab-wise motion I'm trying to make some sort of sense of this thing I don't quite comprehend. When I was working with a lot of American Indian cases involving religion, we would get courts that were saying, well, is this thing central and indispensable to their religion? And then they realized that they were inventing the other guy's religion. They especially realized it when one of our clients being quizzed on the stand about um, the central proposition to this faith looked at the lawyer and said, I'll tell you what, first you prove your God, then I'll prove mine. <laughs> Well, in a sense, trying to analogize to what you think you know can be very deleterious. The British basically invented Islamic law for India by bringing people in and treating them as the experts on these sorts of things. And for a while, that's happened with various other religions in America. But for the most part, it's interesting to, to make a kind of distinction, or anyway, to think maybe the courts should distinguish a little bit more carefully. You tend to get us experts in these situations for Islam because it is a text-based religion. The textualists, the people who are going to read your chapter and verse from some very particular text, and of course you can find different texts. What there isn't enough of, which I think Edgar and others here is suggesting, is but how has Islamic law actually been practiced in the courts of law? Um, allow me to put in a plug for myself. I've just finished a very long paper in which I've looked at um, the situation of women in Muslim courts everywhere and any time I can find. I've I got to be very brief about this. If women pursue their cases to a decision in Muslim family law courts, in one study I have, they win by any criterion 50% of the time. In every single other instance, they win anywhere between 70 and 95% of the time. If that doesn't fit most people's images of what happens actually, but if you go to the actual studies people have done in these courts, it looks rather different. Now, how you explain that and how I have to qualify it, I'll be happy to send you a copy of the paper. But the point is, if the experts were coming in and talking about text, you might get one view of things. If you look at procedure in these Muslim uh, environments, if you look at outcomes, if you look at the actual results across time and Muslim countries, you might get a rather different result. So my own feeling is that the American courts are pretty open. Uh, let me just mention very quickly one case that I don't think was mentioned, you might want to know about. It was a case in which a, a, an Iranian man and woman were getting a divorce in this country in a state in which all of their property, even what they had from before their marriage, is supposed to go into one pot and then be divided. And the woman said, the property I have from before my marriage was by our custom in Iran supposed to be guarded by the man, not belonged to the man. The court did not reach out and adopt Islamic law, but they reached out and found an equitable principle of a constructive trust. And they said that this husband had in fact been the trustee of this property for that period of time, even though their own state said it all goes into one pot and gets divided, they let her keep that property. So I think there, you know, it's going to vary, but I think there is some reaching out here. Um, uh, 
just one small dig for somebody I love, and that's why I love Allah, who is quoted in the paper properly, alas, as saying that there's an incompatibility between Islamic law and American state law, in a sense, because he sees this, I think he's got right, Islamic law sort of wells up from the local situations, and states are trying to apply law from the top down. I don't think it's that simple. I don't think in a common law regime that that's the way it's working. And one has to be a little bit careful. Generally, that many Islamic legal scholars, text-based, American orientalist sort of base, um, tend to be viewing Islamic law as a kind of civil law system and not as a kind of common law system, which I happen to think it is. The paper by Joshua, oh boy, do I have to talk fast. Uh, Joshua is also quite wonderful for no other reason and there are plenty of other reasons because it's very field based. Now we really get to look at what's happening. He did a lot of interviews. You've got to see this stuff here. It's really intriguing. I don't think America, though, is simply assimilationist and Australia is simply multicultural. We saw lots of instances in which each is the other and vice versa, and there is uh, as much of a backlash in Australia now about multiculturalism as there is a kind of propulsion toward multiculturalism in some respects in the United States. Um, Bush was quoted, but by the way, you should remember, boy, can you believe I'm going to defend Bush? Bush actually, when he was first running for, well before 9-11, he always used the phrase, in every church and synagogue and mosque in America. It's very interesting. Um, now, it may be analytically useful, too, to separate sort of the ritual aspects of Sharia from the quote-unquote legal decisional sorts of aspects of it, even though, of course, believers see this as all connected to one another. Um, I particularly appreciated the references here to all the business practices. Those are far less familiar to many of us, especially the academics. Uh, it compares very interestingly to Lisa Bernstein's stuff about the diamond merchants and the grain merchants in New York and Chicago, which might be kept in mind. And I particularly appreciate, which wasn't mentioned, the reference to the Muslim bar associations. I happen to believe that a particularly important counter to corruption is the development of the professional associations. I can tell you that the Muslim <coughs> lawyers I work with in North Africa, they want to be able to practice their professions honorably. They're proud of it. The bar associations, the medical associations, these are very crucial developments for countering corruption. Adib's paper is much more, the paper itself, you really got to read it, a proposal about a kind of constitution that can be adopted not only in Muslim countries, but rather universally. And it's full of wonderfully interesting ideas. Now, for me to be even remotely critical of the actions and thoughts of a man whose courageousness, you know, puts a guy like me utterly to shame is, is hard to do at all. But there are some elements of it that I think are just wonderful and some that I think really need to be thought through. The really interesting thing in this is not that it's simply a rereading of the Quran and trying to construct a constitution that would not be incompatible with that reading. It's rather trying, which is a really interesting idea, to try to concoct a constitution that touches on shared conceptualizations within these cultures. So as you look at that, I really urge you to look, yes, at some of the specific propositions. Uh, I'm not sure that I agree that he, with him, when he would like to have a chamber uh, of uh, academic experts. Um, I'm back to trust, not trusting even, I mean, after 35 years of faculty meetings, I have a little bit of trouble, you know, trusting academic experts to some extent. Um, but the construction of this based not simply on text, but on shared conceptualizations about human nature, about the nature of law, about the nature of relationships. That's a very intriguing notion. If you look at the direct, now the other thing is any constitution is going to supposedly be timeless, but also very much of the concerns of the moment. If you had a constitutional convention right now in America, you can't talk fast. 
If you have one in America, I don't think everybody would scream and yell at with each other about the billeting of soldiers in your private home. But if you were in 1776, it was a concern. And there are aspects of any constitution that's going to be written that are of concerns of the moment. But the Egyptian draft constitution has 236 articles. I'm not trying to be Napoleon, but I would want one that anybody can read and keep on their shelf. You don't try to get back at people or just the momentary circumstances that way. I'm now going to say something nice about Justice Scalia, but if anybody ever says that I did, I'm going to be <laughs> denied or vociferous. Particularly since he said it here at the same time that he wildly insulted a, a student who asked him a question. But Scalia is right. He said any tin pot dictator can have a bill of rights, freedom of religion, freedom of press, blah, 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 blah. That's not where it's at in the Constitution. Where it's at is in the structure of powers. And that's got to be fairly clear, and that's got to be limited, but limited in ways that are consistent, I think, with people's underlying cultural conceptualization. I don't think you can really understand the U.S. Constitution without understanding what the founders meant by the notion of virtue. I don't think you can understand why any constitution would be acceptable if it doesn't touch upon fundamental notions of what people are like and relationships are like, and those are not easy to articulate, and they may seem a bit vague, but they can be sufficiently shared. So detailing things now, this is a constitution we're talking about, not a bill of complaint. That's what you put in your Declaration of Independence. But each of these three papers, then, really gives you wonderfully rich detail that I really urge you to look at and to think about, do certain kinds of constitutions constitute a necessary basis for the goals that one's trying to accomplish? Can they be universalized to some extent? Who will speak for the Sharia in various kinds of ways? And very particularly, what is the reality of religion as it's actually lived, and not just as it may appear in certain textual interpretations? That informs all three of these papers in a very wonderfully rich way. I'd like to thank all our speakers and very quickly open it to questions. I will ask you to keep your questions or comments extremely brief. We have 10 minutes. Hi, I was, uh, I was very fascinated by the papers and also to define how that order, social order should be defended against individual sovereignty. Whereas I understand Western, especially common law in the kinds of traditions that we have derived from England, for example, in this country, as fundamentally about the sovereignty of the individual and how and whether or not it might be compromised by the state. So I was wondering if that creates, contributes, or in any way plays into the kind of dissonance that you constantly get when it comes to understanding where Sharia fits into whatever that is, first of all, <laughs> and how it fits into the kind of legal systems in Western countries. I mean, is that fundamental difference about sort of law upholding individual sovereignty versus law upholding the social order, of which private property is a, is a big chunk, um, playing into this? Thank you. Um, which, um, I think that's open to all of our panelists. Um, well, I'll talk to the Australian context in particular. Um, not being legally trained per se, it's, I'm not going to address the specifics, but at a political level, uh, it's been made very clear that there's, there's zero room for... And it's a ridiculous statement, because legal pluralism is an important part of the Australian legal system. Uh, Indigenous customary laws taken into account, Jewish communities have um, been in courts that are taken into account. And there's cases where Sharia is before the courts, and there's been rulings um, that have actually mediated and decided upon what interpretation they're, they're going to take into the system. So it's very much a political debate about its place. Um, and um, in, in really uh, intricate ways, for example, when was a woman injured her, her uh, neck at work, um, <coughs> couldn't cut her hair, so, sorry, couldn't maintain her hair, had it cut, um, went, uh, returned to um, her husband with her hair cut, he divorced her. 
um, because you know, he was quite extreme. And so there was issues of her uh, suing her employer. And the court ruled in her favour. So legal pluralism is a really dynamic part of the system, but politically speaking, you know, and Australian politics at the moment is very reactionary, um, probably more so than historically even. And so you know, there's this um, argument that people's uh, rights are taken into account within the system, but it doesn't actually um, play out like that politically. Quick answer. I had an article in the past, uh, the Cannibal Democracies. This is a journal article, legal article. And that one I argued about democracies allowing some uh, parties that are not promoting democracy, like Sharia Party, for example, and trying to find a, a kind of a way to get out of the paradox. United States Constitution is a federal constitution which allows flexibility, jurisdiction, for different laws in states, as long as they don't contradict the Constitution, which is similar to Quranic Constitution. I would say Muhammad was the one that really first, not the word was not used exactly because modern word, but the concept of federal jurisdiction, different jurisdiction, multiple jurisdiction, it was in Medina. There were, Muhammad was the secular leader of uh, Jews, Christians, and pagan community in Medina, and they have their own jurisdiction. Therefore, I, I think there is a tension between democracy and uh, secu uh, secularism. Secularism does not allow, for example, a very group of people, let's say Mormons in Utah, to really practice their religion as they want. Well, if they want, if as people, majority of people want, they should be able to do. Therefore, I think that there will be always tension. I think the Sharia that we are calling, it is not really the Quranic Sharia, it is made up by uh, religious clergymen. Sure. Sure. <coughs> Yeah. Sharia needs to be defined. Yeah, whatever it is, whatever it is, should be able to be practiced in pocket of the United States if they have enough population over there. Like Indian laws, they have certain, as long as they don't, for example, torture kids or enslave women and certain uh, that uh, rules, principles that we may not derogate from, we may not allow to have. I don't think there's any Quranic sanction for torturing kids and enslaved. <laughs> well, if there are it's people, torturing. for example, say, beat your kids, force them to pray, for example, this may not allow, or maybe stone you to death. No, that's too much. But within that kind of certain rules, we can say, okay, you can, you should practice. I think you should be more flexible towards accommodating certain cultures and religious beliefs to be practiced as long as they don't violate major principles. Can you give me one second? Sure. Sorry. Yeah, just on, on that note, like, um, I'm not a scholar of Sharia of Shari over Islamic law, nor am I a lawyer so, or a political philosopher, so I'm not going to get, I don't feel far, far from qualified from telling you, but from speaking about the compatibility between Sharia and, is and Islam. Uh, Professor Rosen mentioned one of the things that I was working, text that I was working with was Halak's book on, Islam on Islamic law. And for that same, uh, all of the slides, there's also other studies that are on liberal citizenship and, and Islam. Uh, but as a social historian, what I've noticed is that regardless of whether they're compatible on a normative basis or not, empirically, they are interacting. Because that's just the nature of the American legal system creates these instances in which there has to be some dialogue with the religious tradition. Whether that dialogue fits or not, that's a very different question. But the fact is that that's happening. And what we want to make sure is that that's happening through interlocutors that are properly informed so that they can create a situation in which things operate for the best for all parties involved. So it boils down to who speaks for Islam. That's the take that I was trying to take on, the, the perspective that I was trying to approach the issue from, yeah. Okay, we have several hands in the back. So in the back row first with a gentleman and then a young lady, and then there's a, a gentleman also in the row just uh, next to the back. So we'll start with you. Uh, just a quick comment. I think it would be useful to um, interrogate or maybe detail more precisely what we, we mean by legal pluralism. As a lawyer, I'm a bit uncomfortable with the term legal pluralism because I don't believe it really exists. Um, I believe pluralism exists within a bounded domain created by ultimately a unitary legal system. So in the United States, for example, we have legal pluralism that is bounded by the supremacy clause of the federal constitution. And I think in our understanding of legal pluralism in the Islamic context, at least as the way jurists understood it, there was pluralism that was determined, bounded, <coughs> limited by the supremacy of the Sharia. 
right? And so I think it's, it's always crucial that we try to understand how pluralism in a specific jurisdiction or a specific uh, legal system is structured, because it's, in my opinion at least, there's no such thing as unbounded legal pluralism anywhere. So we have to bear that in mind when we do empirical, uh, when we do our empirical analysis. Thanks. That's, that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, would anyone who would kind of like to respond? gave a brief course to judges at the National Judicial Training Center a couple of summers ago. You wouldn't believe what goes on at the lowest level of courts in this country. Forget about the appellate courts, which get very few cases. There's plenty of pluralism and multiculturalism alive at that level. The cultural defense, they're looking at people's cultural backgrounds. They're taking it into consideration. And if you look at any criminal law casebook, you'll find nothing along these lines. I have, it's just not there. Talk to these judges, they say, look, the guy walks in, he's a Muslim. I'm not going to ignore it. I can't ignore it. It's a factor in life. It's a factor in how I decide this sort of case. Not in terms of which law to apply, but what the consequences of what I do may be. And they will often then fetch around, like with the constructive trust, for something that they think can resolve this sort of situation. Just one last brief comment. Law cases, of course, are not only about resolving disputes. They are very often about articulating a sense of the order of the cosmos. Who, why do you go all the way to the Supreme Court for some kid who's wearing a flag on his butt? It's because you really need, well, how does the world make sense in that situation? And capturing the terms of discussion is one of the most important aspects of any legal system. And as these low-level judges, who I've talked with, attend to how the people of varied backgrounds articulate the standards of their expectable behavior, it becomes part of the way in which the judges then try to capture the terms of the discourse, such that everybody has to talk about it in these terms. No, you can't beat your kid or your wife. I don't care what you did in the old country, and now we'll We'll, we'll refer to that in a very different sort of way. So if you watch what's happening, see, this is what's so great about all of these papers. They really want to look at what's actually happening down on the ground. And as an anthropologist, so do I. <laughs> Thank you. OK, then the young lady in red. Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, you Yeah, uh, okay, so the first part of the question, uh, categories, oh categories. They're useful analytical tools when at be the beginning and the minute you start using them is the minute you realize you don't want them anymore. Uh, sure, I mean, I drew them out in that way mainly for as an analytical tool, but a lot of the time then there's a lot of overlap. Uh, a few in, uh, 
for the most part, it seems like they are kind of drawn out, but there are some instances in which people will have overlapping qualifications. Uh, as far as the sort of the Islamic scholar with the training in the legal tradition, um, there are quite a few that, of the expert witnesses that I've covered, that I identified that had that background. Uh, if I needed an expert in Islam to defend my case in the courtroom, I would probably hire one of them. Uh, because what you find is that a lot of the time, so one of the biggest hurdles that a lot of these uh, experts face is their unfamiliarity with the legal discourse and with the courtroom setting. So <coughs> the, one, like the one case that I tried to notice where one cultural anthropologist said, this is a cultural practice, but that worked against the argument that he was trying to make in terms of law. Whereas people that have a legal training have a familiarity with the, with the context so they know what to do. Um, and I think in the long run that would probably be one good strategy for if we want to have good informed people that are providing the input that we want both from the side of uh, understanding the Islamic tradition but also doing it in a sense of a qualified way that understands how their words are going to be put into practice in the courtroom. That's one particular audience that we might want to encourage to take up this role as an interlocutor. Uh, in terms of a comparative framework, do you mean that, in terms of uh, as clarification, do you mean that with other sort of non common law traditions or within. The with other religious traditions in America. So, for example, there's an article by Sisk and Heinz, two scholars, that compare traditions of uh, First Amendment religious freedom, um, looking at Muslims, Christians, Jews, and others. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's not something that I've worked on, but it's definitely something that I think could have a lot of interesting potential. Uh, I know some scholars are starting to look at that. For instance, Michael Helfman had a really interesting article on sort of uh, arbitration courts between sort of the Jewish arbitration courts and the, the beginnings of Muslim private arbitration courts as well in America. Um, I mean, the thing with expert witnesses is that they do come up not only for Islam, but for a variety of other cultures. And, if I could have access to that particular sort of canon of scholarship, because even now I feel a bit distanced from what the from the material that I was covering, then yeah, sure, I'd love to work on it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for the question. Um, as a political scientist by training, I'm particularly interested in discourse analysis and actually looking at what people are saying and how that's shaping along. Um, I've done a lot of work uh, in the Australian and UK context looking at. Uh, what has been called, I think Colonel Bartles called it, and various other people, the silent majority. Um, so it's the vast majority of Muslims who live their everyday lives without actually saying anything about their faith, they just live day by day. Um, and discourse really is shaped by extreme actors, both outside of the Muslim communities. Um, you've got um, anti-Muslim activity in, in the US, you've got Naomi Darwish, you've got the uh, Heritage Foundation, you've got all these other groups. Um, and you've got on the other hand, within Muslim communities, you've got progressives, you've got moderates. You've, uh, on one hand, you've got extremists and uh, tr uh, extreme textualists on the other. And so, in a lot of ways, the debate is really between these two extremes, these two polarised sort of perceptions of what Islam should be. Um, what I think is emerging out of the, um, you know, the rise of a, a professional class um, is actually a really positive, positive way of influencing and shaping the debate at a, at a far more um, regulated, at a technical level, within government. These people are engaging with government on an everyday basis, becoming not only experts, but just through their, their work, they're shaping the conceptions of powerful people who make decisions about community members. So, um, in, a, in a lot of ways, these people are educated, they're, uh, they've got the cultural capital to really shape discourse in their own way. And it's, in a way, it's, you've got these polarised ends, but they're the middle way. So they're having a really positive impact. I hope that addresses it to some extent. Well, we have now gone several minutes over our time, and we do want to kind of keep on our schedule, so I'll have to let that be the last question. But I'm sure our speakers would be happy to answer questions and discuss with you uh, personally in the break between our panels and uh, after our panels. Uh, so and at our lunchtime, you know, when you're eating. So I will make that the last question. Thanks to our panelists once again and our discussant, and thank you for asking questions. And I guess that adjourns this panel.
Uh, I actually put one of the speakers I In turn, so I will do an introduction for each speaker and then allow that speaker 15 minutes to present their paper, uh, after which I will uh, open the floor to the discussant and try my best to uh, field the questions from the audience. Uh, this panel is on reform in Islamic law, a look at the causes and um, the speakers will be speaking on a variety of fascinating aspects of that general issue, although just to follow up on, uh, on the existential question that was thrown out by Larry Rosen as uh, discussed into the first panel, I think uh, we should note that you know, this is a panel investigating the cause of reform in Sunni Islamic law. So we're clear who's speaking for Islam in this panel. Um, I would like to uh, introduce first Dr. Aisha Musa, who is Assistant Professor of Religion, Islam, and Middle East Studies, a very broad mandate, um, which I'm sure she handles capably at Colgate University. Dr. Musa received her PhD from Harvard in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, and her research has spanned investigation into Islamic thought from the classical to the modern periods. Her work on hadith and fiqh in particular bears relevance, of course, to the issue of jizya and its implications for Muslim-non-Muslim -Muslim relations in Muslim-majority societies today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Aisha Musa. Thank you very much. This is working. Thank you very much, and I, I hope to live up to that fine uh, introduction. Um, and I will apologize. First of all, I was asked just last week to do this paper, so I don't have a PowerPoint or anything fancy. So this is going to be a very low-tech presentation. Uh, I will also let you know that this is a revision of an article that is already published in the, the Filipino Muslim Journal Transcendent Thought. Um, and so the original um, of that this presentation uh, can be read there, uh, and that can be found on my academia.edu page. Uh, but I'd like to begin first uh, by commenting on some of the vocabulary we're using. In particular, I wanted to talk about the vocabulary of reform, and putting that word in quotes. As we saw, heard from the last panel, this idea, there, there is a very negative view of Islam in much of the popular imagination, particularly in the United States. And, and my concern with uh, vocabulary, and I'm a linguist, I did Arabic and um, applied linguistics as a master's degree, Arabic and Islamic studies at, at the doctoral level, so I focus a lot on language. And my discussion today will focus on language and meaning. And I'd like to start with thinking about that word reform. Um, as a cautionary note, because we are, as Muslims and as scholars of Islamic studies, I think in a very defensive mode, uh, intellectually, in this period in time. And, and I think we need to be careful of that. And we don't need to look at reform as, or we should be careful about looking at, at reform in a reactionary sense, that there is something wrong with Islam that we need to reform. Because even though most Americans have never met a Muslim, there is this idea when you ask people what, what they think about Islam, the words that come up are you know, backwards, rigid, oppressive. Islamic law is mired in the seventh century. And all of this grows out of ignorance. So I want to be very careful. We need to be very aware of how we are thinking when we use terms that are kind of imposed from this outside discourse. Um, and I also wanted to highlight the significance of the meanings of the word sharia and fiqh. Sharia is a broad, open way to this, the destination that you want to find. Originally, that uh, a large body of water, the source of life, and something that's necessary for life, and that is a metaphor for um, the idea of returning to God and living the way that God wants us to live in fiqh as understanding, as detailed understanding. These are not, when Americans think of the term law, and this was brought up in a question for the earlier panel, they don't think of it in the sense that Muslims are thinking when they think of the words sharia and fiqh. And so 
I want us to keep that in mind as well. Because Islamic law, in the sense of Sharia and Fiqh, is really meant to reform society. And, and the topic that I'm going to talk about today, Jija, I think is a really good example of how throughout Islamic history, law has not been rigid. There's this idea in the popular consciousness of, of some Muslims and many, many non-Muslims that Islam is this, Islamic law is rigid. Um, I would argue, and I will argue today, that Jija is an example that it is not rigid, that in fact it is fluid. There is fluidity in Islamic law. Uh, great Islamic scholars of the past, such as Ibn al-Arabi, have actually compared Islam to water, which take, appears to take on the color and shape of the vessel that contains it. However, the water doesn't change. The water remains the same, but it appears to take on uh, the color and shape. And, the, uh, and then there's another metaphor of the running river, where you can see the, the rocks of the waterbed underneath the water. And Islam is like the water where you can see the culture in which it's being uh, implemented. So um, I want to highlight that as well, that we're talking about reinterpretation and reformulation rather than the popular concept of reform in the sense that there is something wrong with Islam and it must be reformed. Um, I think that that is a, a misconception that many people have. And I think part of the evidence for this is all of the great Islamic jurists and scholars, past and present, when they give a religious legal opinion, they end with one God is the one who knows. This leaves room for the fact that no matter how great a scholar's knowledge, he or she is not the one who really knows. And so there's always room for reinterpretation. And Jija is an excellent example of that. When we look at um, the detailed studies, there haven't been many, but detailed studies of the history of Jija, such as that done by Daniel Dennett in the 1950s in his work on conversion and poll tax in Islam, shows that throughout history, there have been different implementations of Jija at different times in different contexts. Famously, Omar bin al-Khattab is said not to have imposed jizya as a tax on uh, certain Christian Arab tribes, even though this is the popular conception. And this is uh, informed in some ways by scholarship, scholars who have looked at Aramaic, uh, the word gizya, oh, let's see, where is my Aramaic here? Uh, gizya or gizyar in Aramaic, or the Persian term gizya, which referred to existing taxations uh, in the neighboring empires when Islam arose in Arabia. Um, so there, there are reasons that the word jizya is considered a tax. And in fact, sometimes it has been an oppressive tax that caused people to convert. There have also been times in Islamic history where Christians and Jews were not allowed to convert because that would lower tax revenues for uh, the governments. And taxation is something that every government does, right? I mean, our government imposes taxes on us that we have no right to say, I will pay that tax. So, the, But the idea of Jizya, one of our previous speakers, I believe it was Adib, mentioned how Jizya is seen as something very negative just two weeks ago. There were a number of blog articles about threats that the Islamist government in Egypt is going to impose Jizya on the Copts and how Jizya is this terrible thing that Muslims do to non-Muslims. And so this popular conception rests on the fact that it has been a tax and also a misunderstanding of how Islamic history has worked. So what I'm going to propose today as a thought experiment is that we look at the Quranic uses of the root. Because Jizya only appears as a word once in the Quran, but the, the root of the word appears in 107, uh, 107 ayahs, I think it's 118 times. I have it here in my notes, and for some reason my notes aren't as clear as I thought they would be for me to read. So I'm going to look at how the Quran uses Jizya and suggest that we refract it not through the lens of history and tradition and what Muslims of the past have done, but refracted through a contemporary lens 
because another thing that I will argue is that the Quran has always been refracted through the lens of the history, of the culture, and the society of those Muslim jurists and scholars who have been interpreting the Quran. The Quran, like every scripture, is refracted through the culture and understanding of its readers. No scripture, including the Quran, is ever read in a vacuum. So with that, I would like to turn to the Quranic uses of the, the Arabic word jizya, or the root jizya, yeah. Um, together with the ways that these words are used throughout the Quran. Um, okay, the root appears 117 times in 108 verses. Other than the one verse that uses the word jizya, which is uh, chapter 9, verse 29, which I'll be talking about in a little bit more detail. When we look at the root, we see that the root has the basic meaning of to pay someone recompense for something that they have done. And all of the Quranic uses reflect some aspect of this meaning, and that God gives people recompense for what they have done, and it can be either positive or negative. And the word jazat as reward for or punishment, it's used as reward or punishment, so it's both negative and positive in its use throughout the Quran. And even the historical and traditional understanding of jizya as a tax on non-Muslims fits into this meaning because the traditional understanding is that in, um, in, response, to, in response to them not converting and that, but benefiting from the state's protection, the non-Muslims pay these taxes. So it's in, a, it's in payment based on something that they have done or not done. In this case, keeping their religion yet gaining the benefits of the state. So even the traditional understanding of jizya fits this um, meaning. However, when we look at the context of 929, and this is the one which gives us the idea, from which people get the idea that Muslims are supposed to you know, force non-Muslims to convert or pay jizya or die, which is the popular misconception that we see articulated throughout the blogosphere and the internet these days, is based on its appearance in 929, which says, um, pardon me a moment while I find my quotation, I don't want to. Fight those who do not have faith in God in the last day, fight those who do not have faith in God in the last day and do not prohibit what God and his messenger have prohibited and do not follow the religion of truth from among those who have been given the book until they give the jizya according to their means and they have been subdued. So this, when people read this verse and take it by itself, outside of the context of the rest of the Quranic discourse on a variety of topics included in the verse, it, it leads to the understanding that you fight them until they convert or make this payment. However, when we look at, and this is predicated on the idea that when it says they do not follow the religion of truth, that the religion of truth here means Islam with a capital I, that is one of the accepted forms of uh, one of the schools of Islam that, that is accepted. However, the Quran gives us a different understanding of the religion of truth and people of the book. And this is particularly evident in Surah 98, Surah Al-Bayyina, which describes uh, Dina Qayyima, the upright religion, and talks about the things that the people of the book are required to do, prayer, charity, fasting, worship of one God. Uh, ver various other places throughout the Quran, in chapter 3, for example, we see that not all of the people of the book are alike. Some of them are believers and they stay up all night praying. I'm paraphrasing. This is verses 113 and 114 in chapter 3. So there is this idea that there are believers among the people of the book, those who have received the previous scripture. And if we read 
929, in that context, it gives us a different idea, perhaps, a broader idea of the religion of truth, that Christians and Jews, in fact, can be seen to be practicing the religion of truth if they are, in fact, following what God has revealed to them. And we see in chapter 5, in the verses of, uh, describing God's scripture, the Torah, the Injil, and the Quran, in verses 44 through 48, we see this again, that God tells the Jews, that God questions the Jews, why are they coming to you, referring to Muhammad, for judgment, when they have the Torah, in which God has given judgment. And uh, I think it's verse 47 of chapter 5, this is, the people of the Injil should follow what God has set down in it. So there is this idea, a broader idea of the religion of truth. The other aspect that we have to look at is what is the Quran talking about when it talks about fighting, which brings up the whole issue of jihad, another buzzword in the American popular consciousness and possibly, and also I think Europe as well, but uh, being an American, I'll, I'll limit my comments to that. The idea that Muslims are required to go out and fight and kill non-Muslims. Another popular misconception based on a reading of Quranic verses in isolation from each other. So what happens, we, we look at fight those who do not believe in God in the last day among the people of the book. You know, because they're not following the religion of truth, but what is the religion of truth? And then what does the Quran say about fighting? And chapter 2, verse 190 sets out the basis. Fight those who fight you, but do not aggress, because God does not love the aggressors. And there are some people that would argue this is abrogated by later verses. However, when we look at chapter 9, which is where the verse in which we see the word jizya appears in 29, we look at the beginning of chapter 9, we see what it lays out as fighting. And when we look at verses um, 12 and 13 in chapter 9, this says, won't you fight those who, ex you know, they expel the messenger, etc. And it lists the things that people do. And we see the same things listed in chapter 2, verses 190 through 193. So I would argue that there's no abrogation between chapter 2 and chapter 9 because they're talking about the same things. And if we understand the people of the book who are not prohibiting what God has prohibited and not following the religion of truth, and we look at verse 29 in the context of the earlier verses about those who are fighting the Muslims, those who are attacking the Muslims, those who try to drive out the messenger, we see these very specific activities that allow the Muslims to fight. And I think this is very important for verse 29 because it says, until they pay this jizya and they have been subdued. Okay, so if jizya is a recompense for either pot or a fine, it's either a reward that you get for something good or a fine that is paid for something that you do negatively. And we put it in this context of warfare seeing it in the context of people who have started the war in the first place, as we see in chapter, in earlier verses in chapter 9, I believe it's 12 and 13, it, to me, this is saying that these people of the book have done what the earlier verses say and started a conflict, a military conflict with Muslims. And the Muslims have fought back because if we're looking at a holistic context of what the Quran is talking about, about the religion of truth, and about what fighting is and what fighting entails, then my argument, the gist of my argument is that when we're looking at Jizya in a contemporary context, I argue that we can see it as war reparations paid by those non-Muslims who attacked Muslims, fought them, once the war is over and they have been subdued, they pay reparations. Now, this, I understand, that this understanding of Jizya is dramatically different than any previous understandings of Jizya. However, I would argue that it's in keeping with a holistic reading of the text of the Quran 
based on an understanding of the meanings of the Arabic terms, refracted, as I said, through the lens of the world in which we live, which is the way in which I would argue and do argue that all Muslim jurists and scholars have understood the Quran. They have never understood it in a vacuum. They refract it through their own life experience and the experience of the world around them. And I suggest that we as Muslims do the same. It's faithful to the text, refracting it through our own contemporary lens and making sense of it in light of the entire text. And with that, I will end. Thank you. Dr. Abdul Rabb will be our next speaker. Dr. Rabb has a long and distinguished career as an economist and financial advisor. So he knows whereof he speaks on matters related to interest in the Islamic tradition. In addition to working for various governments and NGOs, such as those of Bangladesh and Pakistan, UNIDO, UNDP, USAID, and the World Bank, he has also found time to explore from a pietistic perspective Islamic traditions' relevance to various issues. Please join me, uh, such as the one that he will be speaking on today, the discussion of interest in the Quran. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rao. The initial interest 
is not credible. What made it credible was the court or the increase in capital several fold by continued redoubling. Second, he argues that in modern finance, the practice of interest is different and, per, and court performs the all important function that any price mechanism performs, unquote. He argues that without interest, an economy will have no way to control the uh, supply of money, supply of credit, uh, and for the rationing, it, 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 to control the rationing of credit available, so to say, and to assign prior priorities. He dismisses Abunara Mahmoudi's assertion that interest was simply a matter of haggling and, and speculation on the part of lenders and borrowers. Abdul Rahman rightly points out rightly points out that uh, interest depends on bank interest depends on many complex economic factors but he did not analyze these factors he also speaks of a cooperative cooperative welfare or sadaka system sadaka uh, system in which there is no need for interest Fazlur Rahman's idea of a welfare system is somewhat parallel but not exactly similar uh, to the idea of a stationary state that economists sometimes talk about. In the stationary state, there is no need for interest to arise, but our real world is far from reaching that state. Several other modern scholars have associated themselves with this distinction between IBA and interest. Yusuf Ali, in a com commentary, his Quran translation says, My definition of riba would include profiteering of all kinds, but exclude economic credit, the creature of modern banking and finance. Unquote. Muhammad Asad, Muhammad Pitta, M.S. Shaki, and Eddie Pixel and his colleagues also translate riba as usually in an excessive sense. The Turkish columnist and author Mustafa Akhil thinks that Turkey's first development Turkey's first development among the Muslim countries is in significant part due to its rejection of the orthodox view of interest promoted by Saif Tutu and Maulana Maududi. I also argue in a similar way, citing the Quran, Quranic verses 2 to 275, 2 to 76, 3, 130, 2, 278, 280, I make these points. Viva, not in the sense of modern bank interest, is not comparable to profit on trading in trading. Exploitative profit exploitative profit is analogous to <coughs> exploitative interest. When we strip out the exploitation element from both profit and, and interest, both should stand on the same footing. If then I argue if circumstances of a borrower warrant humanitarian consideration, the lender should remit interest altogether, postpone the loan repayment, and is still better 
right of the loan as collateral. We should also make a distinction between nominal and real interest. Just talking in terms of nominal interest does not make sense. Keeping nominal interest the same in an inflationary situation, which is usually the case in the modern economy, will make the lender lose and the borrower gain in real terms. Thus, money, lending, and borrowing almost invariably involve some interest element in real terms, even if no nominal interest is charged on the loan. Those who uh, support and espouse Islamic finance and banking, you know, they always talk in terms of nominal interest. And I've read they should keep in mind that even if you keep the interest rate at zero level, it doesn't make sense. This brings us to the major causes, conditions that give rise to interest. First is the price level change, inflation is usually cited, inflation. We normally have an inflationary situation in the modern economy. But occasionally we have also a deflationary situation. If there is an inflationary situation, it, it warrants if the use of a higher interest rate. And if it is a deflationary situation, you need to lower the use interest rate, or probably make it negative. Now, in the American economy, you know what's going on. The central interest rate is almost near the zero level. So inflation is the, is the first cause, second cause is people's time preference. This uh, sorry. people's time preference uh, is people value goods and money at the present time more at the present time than the future date. This is people's time preference. And the third is business profits. It's probably one of the most important causes. So, what's the role of another factor is economic growth. With higher real economic growth, real interest also goes up. What is the significance of the role of interest in the modern economy? Interest plays a crucial role in a modern economy. Economic policy makers need to ensure that the economy does not get overheated to generate undue inflation or it does not slide into a recession with inflation. An inflationary situation warrants the use of a higher interest rate and vice versa in a deflationary situation. Modern economic theory shows how interest plays a vital role in allocating productive resources in the most efficient manner. It plays an equilibrating role in bringing all economic forces to work in a systematic, symbiotic way toward an equilibrium situation where the marginal rate of interest deter on profit or profit on new capital, as well as the marginal rate of time preference is equal to the prevailing rate of interest. I, it seems I, I have very limited time. I, I would uh, like to say something on this time in a previous speaker in the previous panel mentioned Islamic finance and banking. Uh, I am not quite comfortable with the term. It is a contradiction in terms of Islamic finance, in, in, in a way. Because if you closely look at how Islamic banks function, operate, you will find that they use interest more than they do not use interest. Actually, much more than that. They, uh, I have explained in my paper 
I quickly, I quickly go through my statement. It has made impressive growth. Our growth is not matched by relative, uh, relative weight in total credit. In, for example, in Indonesia, Islamic banks account for only 4.2 percent of the total credit supply in the economy. Criteria used. You are familiar with these. No involved financial activities. No, no predetermined rate of return should be used. And no involvement in businesses deemed uh, unlawful. Major investment products. I don't like to go out through all this. I have limited time. <coughs> but one thing I like to emphasize here. One, one, one of the two, two, two of the products. They offer called Mudaraba and Muraaba. Mudaraba and Musaraka. These are participatory uh, product based on participatory profit and loss sharing risks. PLS investment. Well, this, this is the only part in Islamic banking where interest can be avoided. But I have put in my paper that. This Mudaraba and uh, Musharaka uh, part is very minimally used in Islamic banks. If you look at this chart very carefully, you can find. I just read uh, uh, the yeah, and the chart shows that in actual practice, the PLS or uh, equity financing principle is is uh, found to be the least used. Yeah. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Zainab, Assistant Professor of Islamic Studies at Howard University School of Divinity. Dr. Awani has spoken and researched extensively on women and family law after receiving her PhD at the International Islamic University of Malaysia, uh, which I believe adheres to a Sunni Salafi curriculum. No? Sunni curriculum. Her numerous works on women and family and its application in the West have been published by the International Institute of Islamic Thought. Um, and her examination of the recent reforms underway in Morocco, based on the Maliki Madhab's Mudawana, will be examined in what is surely a fascinating paper. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alwani. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'd like to thank, of course, the organizers. I thank you, uh, Dr. Dani. I'd like also to thank uh, Dr. Musa for her wonderful introduction. Uh, I guess uh, at least now I'm not going through uh, if I'm in reform. Uh, it's, uh, it's well said. Um, this research uh, or this presentation is really one part of a long research that I'm doing on uh, family law, especially with a focus on uh, Muslim majority countries. Uh, the first one is uh, Morocco and Egypt, and I'm trying here to work uh, with uh, Morocco uh, more than uh, Egypt. Uh, the focus is on Morocco. Um, later, could I have my code, please? It's in my bag. I'm sorry. Where is your bag? Where is your bag? Where is your bag? This one is also it's uh, my summer uh, research in Morocco. At the same time, I also I uh, was participating in a conference in Netherlands on the same topic about uh, Islamic family law. And it's very interesting because uh, the European researchers who work on uh, also the reform of Islamic family law in Morocco and Egypt uh, mostly were uh, presenting their research and papers uh, on the issue. Uh, but in this, sorry. Um, the 
presentation here, I will just try to really ask a uh, few questions. The first one is, what is the role of Moroccan women in advancing the conversation on gender justice, family stability, and societal development? What are the effective and failed reform strategies of, uh, for advancing gender <coughs> justice and women's rights in Morocco? And of course, I will avoid even the meaning to go through the meaning of women rights because this is something that comes with the research. How these um, legal strategies influence uh, Moroccan women and family socioeconomic reality. Uh, however, in, in this presentation, I will try to provide a concise overview of the three issues. Um, first, a uh, view on Islamic family law in general and also uh, in Morocco, the Mudawana, and also the role of Moroccan women in family law reform and its impact on Moroccan society. Um, I'll try to present a case study as, as uh, the third uh, uh, presenter here, and then the conclusion. Um, my aim really, and uh, after meeting and interviewing uh, many of the men and women in, in Morocco and also in Netherlands is to forwarding the critical and joint conversations by drawing mutual understanding between feminists and Islamists, although I don't prefer to use Islamists, but just for the sake of this presentation, on intellectual debates on these subjects over the past decade, one, uh, ten, almost ten, for ten years. Uh, the Islamic family law, when we're speaking, of course, about Islamic family law, gender mostly in terms of the oppression of women is often the first issue that comes to mind. Western mainstream media and some academic uh, literature respect, uh, present Muslim women as a victim of patriarchal family laws that grant them little claim to legal rights. Within this context, the conceptual domain of gender and family have functioned as competing sites where more deeply ingrained ideological and post-colonial conflicts are played out. Within intra-Muslim discourses, the, family, the familial sphere is often portrayed as a, the stronghold wherein religious identity and so-called traditional values must be protected against advances <coughs> of Western capitalist influences on women and various other tribulations. Throughout the colonial era and beyond, the sphere of family and personal status law has been one area uh, where in classical Islamic legal thought maintained considerable, considerable sway, uh, a trend that continues until the present. The Mudawana. The divergence between Islamic law in theory and Islamic law in practice is the result of how Islamic family law was written into state law in the 19th and early in the early 20th centuries throughout the Muslim world. A growing body of scholarship suggested, especially by Halab and Tucker, that the process of legal codification was both selective and partial. Far from advancing the legal status of women, legal uh, codification actually narrowed the range of rights and, uh, that women had access to in classical Islam jurisprudence, and that's also according to Qureshi and Songo. However, in Morocco, the first family code or Mudawana was introduced after independence in 1956. After much debate, there were limited reforms under King Hassan the second in 1993, and more radically in 2004, when a new family court was introduced by uh, his successor, King Muhammad V. After the death of the Hassan in 1999, and Muhammad V, a known supporter of uh, women's rights, the debate on family law, uh, law reform increased in intensity and gained a new momentum. Claims of cultural authenticity and true Islam were important in this debate. The role of uh, Moroccan women in the family law reform, a 
according to one of the feminists, uh, Zakiya Salim, in her introduction between feminism and Islam, human rights and Sharia law in Morocco, she stated that the struggle over women's rights in Morocco became the site of feminist movement and debates by activists, religious authorities, and decision makers across the country. It is important to note uh, that the feminist groups are mobilized by the United Nations, regime of rights, and especially women's rights, and liberal discourses of equality and individual rights to request the, uh, to secularize the Mudawana. Empowered by the UN decades for, of, uh, for women since 19, from 1979 to 1985, and sponsored through transnational funds. These groups perceive the legal system as an engine of social change and therefore targeted the Mudawana as a means to remove the conditions of gender inequalities from the state-controlled and <coughs> religious-based codification of women's rights. In 1992, these groups stood In 1992, these groups stood against the Sharia-based family law by launching a mass petition campaign, collecting one million signatures against Mudawana. Most of their leaders had been active in leftist political parties since 1970s, before forming their independent uh, organizations in the 1980s. During the 1980s, another mass movement was on the rise, the Islamic movement, as a reaction to the first one. These women uh, with the Islamic movement uh, have been shaped in informal women's circles. Family law is, it was the center to this movement because it is the only state code that claims adherence to Sharia law. And thus preserving it became a major goal for these groups. Due to the intensity of the debate on family law reform after several, uh, several uh, appeals for this support, for uh, King Muhammad V appointed a commission to draft a new family code in which both men and women from various disciplines were represented. This reform was framed as being in line with human rights and with religion. By using the term Sharia, referring to his position as a near mu'min, commander of the faithful, and by entrusting the commission with the task of ijtihad, as it was mentioned. Eventually, the new Mudawana was accepted by all parties under pressure from the king and took effect in February 2004. The law was published with explanation based upon shared responsibility, affection, equality, equity, and also healthy social relations and proper upbringing of, of children. Yet, the explanation to the Moroccan Dawan of 2004 remains rather vague about the actual problem for which the reforms should be a solution, not it wasn't clear. The new family Court is framed as a part of uh, trying to democratize the uh, or a process of democratized Morocco, the new Morocco. Uh, the solution of court um, consists mo mostly of improvement in women's rights during marriage and after divorce, such as placing the family under joint responsibility of, of the spouses the husband being the head of the family before and removing any dictating uh, terms for women. From the, this is also from the text of Dawan. Uh, the case study, for example, for in the new, uh, new Mudawana, uh, if we take the, the divorce, for example, or the Havana, the uh, child custody, uh, this is for 10 years now, the Mudawana, since uh, 2004 to uh, 2013. 
uh, when I went to Morocco, still they are debating this issue, while they, uh, the Mudawana itself abide with uh, trying to find the best for women and serves women according to what they felt this is the best. So for the Havana and the child custody is taken, of course, for the women, for the uh, shukaf or this is no fault divorce. Uh, also, it's for uh, the women's advantage. But at the same time, to this day, uh, they, are, they are finding this is also very difficult because they really, in so many areas, the culture was ignored, and also in some areas, uh, the earth, the customs also was ignored within the law, but uh, this is something that now, I guess, it's a new debate that's going on. So it's not uh, only the Madonna to be uh, in this space. Um, I will uh, just, because I have a few minutes, uh, I will just add two minutes okay, two minutes. Uh, I guess for, for reaching or trying to um, approach or different uh, the reform itself, uh, maybe the effective strategies that women use, uh, rallying, demanding their rights, uh, organizing uh, their uh, followers in a way, uh, and also of course connecting with each other. Uh, but still in, in, that, in Morocco, uh, there is some kind of uh, disconnecting between the feminists and the, the Islamists or the, from the Islamic movement, and that's what they are working on now. There, there's something else. Uh, also, that the issue of earth or the issue of customs in Morocco is very powerful, and it was really kind of ignored from the, the feminists and the Muslims, also the Islamists, in regard of how to define the art, which one is the positive, which one is the negative, and how, how you can also study the art according to the Quran and Sunnah. The other problem is also uh, between the both, the uh, intellectual level of that kind of debate about Sharia and fiqh, uh, for feminists to reject Sharia uh, without uh, paying attention to different discourses and different also interpretation of the Quran and the Sunnah, at the same time also for the Muslims themselves that uh, were not really uh, active in a way to invite the new interpretations. Uh, and, and in this case, of course, had that kind of, uh, uh, the, the debate was uh, as an incomplete and it's still uh, in, in a way that there is fractions instead of unity in their way and working towards this. In exploring such circumstances, I advance the following proposition, of course, rather than attempt to demand conflicted requested from Moroccan women movements, women should uh, devote their collective energies to strengthen existing civil legislation positive and they have to, in this case, study which, uh, which of the legislations are positive, not only for women, but even for society, for families uh, at large, because now, really, they, they, uh, they are facing the reality, and the reality is not that good. It's not only calling for women's rights, it means we'll resolve and solve all the problems, but the reality is there are so many other issues that it needs to be studied, well studied by both uh, women from the uh, both movements. Um, so in this case also that's uh, what I, uh, for legislation to developing uh, community support programs and to continue conversations on the roles, rights, and expectations of spouses within an Islamic framework of mutual care. Uh, two, policy makers, community leaders, and religious authorities must work together to forward policies and enact procedures that allow for integration between religious and civil requirements. It means from both sides. Uh, three, activists, religious and civil uh, together must work together to ensure that family support services can meet uh, persistent demands without marginalizing the interest of women or men or children. In this context, I argue that there are pressing needs to ensure the family community leadership, including feminist and Islamist 
should work together in order to achieve the greater goals. And in this case, also for this, women's purviews and areas of expertise must be sought out and represented in a much more organized fashion. And especially by reading the, the uh, Quran and the Sunnah, and also by understanding uh, the circumstances and reality in Morocco. Thank you. Twelve to fifteen minutes, but maybe just twelve-ish. Um, but it doesn't look like we're a little behind schedule. Okay, thank you. Um, three wonderful papers. I'm very honored to uh, have this opportunity to uh, to think out loud about them. Um, back when I was a guitar teacher, uh, I had this problem where I would uh, my students would do something wonderful and amazing, and I would just want to just get right to the things that we could do to make them even more wonderful and amazing, but uh, and, and would forget to acknowledge how, how, how much they rocked. So I just wanted to first acknowledge that these, these papers all rocked and I really enjoyed them. Um, so I think one of the challenges for me right now is that we had three um, excellent papers that take different approaches to three very different topics. Um, Revisiting technical definitions of con contemporary interest versus seventh century usurious loaning practices, or RIPA, uh, Quranic hermeneutics, and the interpretation of a contested and controversial principle that is uh, jizya, uh, and the role of women scholars in reform in Morocco, and, and a number of um, additional issues related to that. Um, so it seems to me, um, if I may, we might find something that, that uh, links all of these is the notion of competing epistemologies. Uh, that in a best case scenario are um, the roots and causes of reform and, and, and resistance to reform. Uh, and in a worst case, if we're practicing uh, Lund or having suspicion of uh, the people that we uh, agree or disagree with, uh, we can attribute our opponents' uh, root motivations to uh, worldly desires or backward conservatism or whatever. But proceeding with Husnul Lund, with a good opinion, um, I think it's safe to say that this is at the root. Uh, we, there's, there's issues. Before we even get to the issues that we're talking about here today, there's issues related to uh, where, uh, where, where is the source of truth? How, how is the truth on legal, uh, especially legal matters, known? Legal and political matters that relate to that. So that, that may seem obvious, uh, but I thought maybe I'd comment a little about these competing epistemologies as I understand them. Um, I like to think in terms of uh, the Atal, Adal, Adian, and Wadi sort of Akli, uh, Adian, Adian, Wadi approaches to knowledge, that is uh, rational, um, uh, empirical, or uh, sort of divinely revealed um, ways of knowing. Um, and so there are, there are different disagreements uh, in, each, uh, in, in various different camps on, on how do we get to the truth of the matter? Um, how do we know whether uh, Ripa is, is one uh, practice or another practice, or you know, whether or not modern uh, day Ripa, uh, modern day uh, interest is, is Ripa or something else. Um, so, some would say that the intellect is the primary source of truth, with or without prophets. This was uh, one aspect of what we would call uh, some forms of reform movements. And again, I really appreciate uh, uh, everybody's uh, emphasis on, on problematizing the term uh, reform. Uh, so I'll just throw it around nonetheless, uh, <laughs> without having the time to, to break down exactly what I'm referring to. But uh, uh, another approach to the intellect is the, uh, the intellect as a tool of interpreting divinely revealed truth that still needs prophets, as opposed to being the sore, uh, sole uh, source. And then there's a, a position that's something in between, um, which uh, I only have a, some broad strokes understandings of uh, from the Maturidi perspective. Um, Approaches to the empirical knowledge, to uh, empirical observation and metaphysical deductions therefrom, and the technological advances uh, derived from them, uh, some would consider these to be more dependable and valuable than literal, literal readings of religious texts or ascetic spiritual lifestyles. Another group uh, might look at empirical observation uh, and consider it to be uh, trumped by the inherited interpretations of divine texts uh, and the technical adva technological advances uh, are potentially suspect, uh, technological, political, theological, uh, and other uh, philosophical and other ideas as well um, that, that stem from these uh, empirical observations. Uh, and then something more realistic, a third perspective might be something more realistic between A and B, between these uh, previous two 
approaches to uh, empirical knowledge. Um, and again, this, uh, then the third category of, of what would fall under divinely revealed knowledge, um, that one, the first position might be that certain broad principles uh, are constant within divine revelation, which can vary drastically in the particular application. A second group might say that there are certain broad principles and particulars, derived particulars, that are con uh, constants, uh, which are all but eternal. Um, and something, again, more realistic in between the two, maybe perhaps stricter on the particulars, that is the derived uh, rulings uh, from, the, um, from the broad principles, uh, but still uh, an approach that's aware of the flexibility uh, and the need for contextualizing um, rulings. So how do we deal with these, uh, these competing voices? I've given sort of a, um, almost a caricature of each three, but uh, a very general impression of what we might call reform, um, modernist, reformist, and then uh, sort of hidebound conservative uh, traditionalist, and then that sort of in-between traditionalism. Um, so how do we deal with these con competing voices uh, of, of determining uh, the truth of the matter and on, on what is jizya, uh, and what is ribba, and what are the rights and roles of women in society. Um, so I, I work from a perspective um, that is, uh, is sensitive to many of the uh, reform perspectives, but um, considers that similar, very similar results can actually be reached um, through engaging the tradition, even when there are aspects of that tradition that you uh, may disagree with. Uh, all views must come to the table, which I think is a, a very um, important contribution that uh, Dr. Zainab has uh, offered for us. Uh, we have to bring all of these views to the table. Um, putting putting uh, the tradition aside, uh, trying to put that in the garbage is uh, <laughs> is akin to uh, uh, you know putting a three-year-old in a, in a in a crib. It just won't stay in there. So you have to you have to engage uh, with these traditions. So uh, I was uh, I really enjoyed reading Dr. Musa's uh, paper. Um, the excellent point that we need to understand the linguistic, legal, uh, and uh, arfi or um, cultural uh, uh, interpretations of terms. When we use the terms Muslim, when we use the term Islamophobe, when we, uh, sorry, when we use these various different, I'm sorry, Sharia and Jihad from uh, the, 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 the cultural perspectives that Muslims bring, that Islamophobes bring, that uh, various different academics from different academic uh, traditions bring, we need to coordinate our methodologies, coordinate our terminologies before we even begin. Uh, the, the discussion to be sure that we are using uh, the same terms. Uh, this is a very important place to start with. So I also think it was a very important um, observation that uh, tying the term jizya to the term jihad uh, needs a tremendous, we need a, a tremendous amount of unpacking of the discussion of jihad as well to understand uh, where uh, jizya plays into this. Um, I, 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 I learned a lot from thinking about jizya as recompense, right? We learned very early on, those of us who uh, did not grow up uh, as Muslims or uh, speaking Arabic, uh, that, you know, Jazakallah Khair just means like, hey, thanks, right? But uh, it has a, a sort of a, a deeper implication here now, and I have a, a much better appreciation of, of you know, uh, not just saying, may God give you the very best, but may, may God, uh, you know, give you recompense, may God, may, may God, may God give you in recompense uh, for your good, the very good. Um, so I think this is a very important um, linguistic, luhui, uh, understanding that we have to keep in mind when we address the various different um, uh, istilahi or technical meanings um, of the from the latter um, uh, from, you know, from uh, these various different um, opinions from the tradition. Um, so a, a, another important point was um, just again not not looking at this as a blanket uh, blanket tax for non-Muslims who don't con convert, uh, and that we also should think of this the, that we need to also discuss this uh, broader idea of the religion of truth, that, uh, that the Ahl Kitab uh, may not be the, the, uh, the only risk, that we don't divide them into Dini and Harbi, for example, that there could be other approaches to them. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, I think the, um, um, what I guess I'd like to, to, to bring uh, to, the, to the discussion about um, these competing definitions of, um, of jizya uh, and, and questioning whether or not um, uh, contemporary um, uh, loaning and, and, and uh, interest practices um, are in fact extortionate or not um, 
is that we uh, uh, that we should uh, and also I mean the, the, the discussion about um, uh, Moroccan women and other Muslim women's um, roles in legal discussions that uh, I think it's worth bringing in a traditional Sulli perspective as opposed to some of the other perspectives um, that there are matters that are kata'i, that there are matters where there is uh, no um, room for, for um, multiple interpretations, but that the vast sea of uh, other interpretations are lundi, that they, ex uh, they accept um, multiple possible interpretations, that we should be aware of um, putting aside uh, um, an interpretive tradition and uh, viewed as atomistic um, when we must, we all, we are, we are forced to inherit the tradition, the linguistic tradition, or the study of Arabic, that we have uh, its sciences and its meanings passed down through uh, traditions that um, people with, with perspectives, they chose certain uh, um, examples of pre-Islamic poetry and perhaps left others out, um, that we, as uh, one of our retiring colleagues recently said, no one is a self-made man, that who invented that thing called language, um, that we still must, uh, you know, uh, embrace the traditional um, inheritance of, uh, or at least not embrace, but we must engage with the uh, traditional inheritance of, uh, of the language. So, that is the, I, yeah, it's the best that I, I will do in my, my 12 minutes, or however many I want to offer. But uh, thank you very much, I really uh, enjoyed the process and the experience of uh, I, I believe we might be allowed by uh, Mr. Hamdan to I'm from Morocco, so it's a pleasure to listen to your presentation. Um, during your research in Morocco, were you able to explore the role of the state-sponsored Murshidat and Alimat, who are kind of forging a new form of state Islamic feminism and who have larger who have access to larger communities, both in urban and um, rural areas, and are and have the potential of conveying. Um, the spirit of the Mudawana in accordance with the lived realities of those different people, as opposed to... Sorry, can we just, can we just limit it to yeah, the question? Yeah. Sorry, yeah, as we do have to go. Yeah, as opposed to more liberal or secular feminists, or even the Islamists who are believed to have other ideological agendas. Should I ask? More should that. More should that. <laughs> Um, yes, indeed. Um, I, I think that the role of Mushidat now is in between, exactly. But there is one problem. It's uh, more focused now on Alimat, because in Morocco, I found it, which is different than in Egypt, uh, there is a system, and that system enforced by the government. So you have Alimat, you have Mushidat, and you have uh, scholars, and I don't know how many of them. But uh, the Mushidat really, uh, even the training, it should be really higher uh, than what it is right now. Uh, it should be something that may, may be similar to Alimat uh, in order to reach the level that they can convey this uh, type of message and be uh, uh, playing the role, I guess, in between the two movements. The best I found it, at least for now, it's, I think, the role of Alimat, who are trying really uh, to invite the feminists and liberalists to come to have that kind of conversation. Uh, but for the Moshida, their role is more about uh, with the public and, and enforcing the meaning of Mudawana. Uh, it, it's, uh, in, in a way, at least now, if they can really focus on uh, sifting and filtering the positives and the negatives from the not only the Mudawana but also the customs in the Arab, which is also that's competing with the Mudawana, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a hand. Yes. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> give me just one minute to have the background. Uh, for Aisha, um, major betrayal of the Quran centuries later happened true epistemology as a source of religion, not the Quran. Quran is not enough. We need these and that additions to the Quran. They didn't call verses, but they in practice, they made it equal even about the Quran. One is distortion in obey God and messenger. They separated God from messenger. 
Messenger equal to Fari and Terlizzi. And the second was to me three major distortions epistemologically. The other about the verse of the Quran about Mutashabi, chapter 3, verse 7, I think, or yeah, it is about the meaning of Mutashabi. That verse is distorted and entirely opened up for all kind of uh, surgery in Islam. And the third one is which you mentioned, abrogation which by this way they basically created contradictions in the Quran because they couldn't understand the Quran because of following so many contradictions. I'm sorry, we really have to, really have to ask the question. Yes, here is the question about the abrogation uh, so-called is used uh, um, by using the verse 2106. What do you think about that? Do you have any research on the verse that been used to create contradiction in the Quran and abrogate verses of the most detailed research on the verse you mentioned and other verses, um, I would refer you to uh, John Burton's seminal work. Um, the, I think it's, the title is "The Sources of Islamic Law Theory: Islamic Theories of Abrogation." Um, and Burton has done extensive research on the different theories of abrogation and how they came about in the third century after Hijra. Um, my personal understanding from the kind of work that I do, the type of interpretive work uh, that this paper is about, and I encourage you to actually read my uh, article and you'll see in more depth exactly how I go about interpreting. Uh, but I don't see abrogation in these verses. I see that when we read the Quran as an entire text, rather than atomistically, verse by verse, that the instances that are said to or thought to be abrogation are really not. Yes, please. Two small questions. You know, I was told got a limited to three minutes and ask the question. So how many you can squeeze in the three minutes? Okay. challenges, uh, I think, create a new 
conversation between the two. And, and that's what the, it counts as enrichment. Uh, uh, and maybe it will be useful really for the society at large. Uh, because in this case, they challenge the Islamists to come with the uh, with the, the new ideas, with uh, the new also a discourse, uh, which is based on Quran and Sunnah, and that's by itself. I think that's what uh, now the conversation is taking uh, the uh, idea of how to approach the Quran holistically, uh, how to approach the Quran and the Sunnah, how to uh, how the, the the Sunnah really impacted the women. Uh, 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 status uh, in the, the first community. So all kinds of different issues, which is really the issues that it, it's uh, fundamental for this discourse, I think now it's coming to listening by listening from both sides. And I hope that's what the Thank you. And now for our last question. Um, I'm wondering if you could briefly compare the amounts and history of Tunisia and Zakat. Um, she's asking if I could briefly compare the amounts and history of Chizia and, and Sakat. The short answer is, wow, I don't think so. Um, because Chizia was not necessarily a fixed amount. We have had from the tradition, from the Sunnah, from the Hadith, the fixed amount of Sakat of 2.5% of uh, the collected wealth after a year. Um, there was never a fixed amount for Jizya that, that I've seen discussed in the history. Um, it was based on the ability of individuals to pay sometimes. Sometimes it was higher, sometimes it was lower. Um, again, I think that we have to keep in mind that when governments do taxation, they do taxation to gain revenue. And so there are some very practical reasons that Jizya might have been understood differently from time to time and place to place. Oftentimes it was levied on a community. Sometimes individuals had to pay it, but oftentimes it was a representative of the community that had to go before an official, you know, of the Muslim state and, and pay it on behalf of the community after it had been collected from the members of the community. Um, so I, I just think that the history of Jizya is so varied um, that we cannot say that there is one single Muslim understanding of exactly how much it was supposed to be, or exactly what it was supposed to be, or exactly who was to pay it. Because of this, of this, this very famous instance in which Omar bin al Khattab did not charge Jizya to some Arab Christian tribes. They said, look, we're Arabs, like you're Arabs. We'll pay Sadaqa, we won't pay Jizya. And so wording, terminology becomes important. And, and I think we need to be really aware of the terminology. But as textualists, I think we really need to ground it in the text of the Quran. Uh, because that's where we get the word in a religious sense. And Muslims say, this is what the Quran says, the words in the Quran. So how do we understand that? But again, that's never, ever in a vacuum. Thank you to all our panelists and to the questions from the audience uh, for a thought-provoking discussion. And I think we're continuing now for the break and lunch. Yeah, and can someone lead them to the Carl Field Center? Could you, since you're from here, you know it is? Sure. All work together. Yeah? I